All right, my name is Chris Cornett. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, authentication and authorization. Um, this is kind of a, a little bit of a high level talk, so if you're expecting code examples and that kind of stuff, you're probably not going to get any of that. Um, I will get into some of the specifics about you know, different solutions and different options for, you know, for these two kind of major categories, but no real hardcore code kind of stuff. So when you're thinking about authentication, authorization, you know, permissioning, all that kind of stuff, what you're really thinking about is a kind of an agreement between the user and the service. Um, you know, the user is saying, here's who I am, and the service says, oh, okay, I understand that, you know, here's what you have access to. Um, you know, you, you, it's essentially verifying the identity of the user. Um, now, over, you know, over the internet, over the web, that kind of stuff is really difficult. Um, because you can only, you can only, and I get into this a little bit later, but you can only verify that to a certain extent. Um, you know, you can give a password, you can, you know, give two-factor authentication, all that kind of stuff. But really, all that stuff can be faked because you have no idea who that physical person is sitting on the other side. Um, you just have to kind of verify it as much as possible. Um, so first off, for the people that may or may not know the differences between authentication and authorization, um, they are slightly different. Um, authentication is kind of the first step. It's, you know, whenever you go to the site, you actually provide your username and password, you know, you, you provide that information. Um, and you're trying to verify the truth about who that person is on the other side. Um, and confirming their identity, and basically it's just kind of a satisfactory yes or no. Uh, it's completely up to you and your service how far you want to take this. Uh, you know, if it's super sensitive information, maybe you want to have to do username and password, security question, two-factor authentication, you know, even out to some kind of biometrics. Uh, it just depends on how far you want to go. Uh, but you have to have that balance between usability and security. Otherwise, your users are going to give up and go on to another service. Um, you know, I highly recommend, if you possibly can, not just having one factor not just having a username and password. Um, a lot of sites out there will just do that kind of stuff, and you know, more often than not, those are the ones that are going to be more likely to be hacked or anything like that. Uh, you'll see a lot of applications, a lot of services now that are just dropping into factor authentication. Um, most customers of their sites, of their services, don't find it to be too big of an inconvenience, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that kind of stuff later. Um, obviously, it's technically impossible to figure out who the actual physical person or machine or whatever it is sitting on the other side is. Um, and when you're thinking about it, you also have to think about anonymous users. Um, you know, your service may have certain features that are only enabled for users that are actually logged in, but you also have to think about anything that may need to be, you know, uh, protected, any kind of rate limiting, anything like that that's public information you know, any services that you may provide that are just generic kind of things. Um, and no, I don't mean that anonymous, if you're taking it in a security context. I'm sure most of you have heard about all sorts of fun things that they've done in the past. Uh, there's a couple of different types of authentication. Um, there's the more traditional username and password. Uh, obviously, passwords have their own problems. Um, but more often than not, you know, when people create new applications, they drop in the username and password and, and run with that. Um, you can introduce two-factor authentication. How many people use this on any of the sites that you're on? Okay, that's good. That's good. I wish more hands, but if you're using a service and they've sent you an email or anything about two-factor authentication, definitely check it out. Um, it can only help, and it's really not that big of a hindrance to, you know, to enter a new code or whatever each time. Um, I think, let's see, GitHub, Dropbox, uh, Google, there, there's all sorts of the major, which one? Yeah, Steam does it too. Um, there's tons of services out there that are doing it, and there's also lots of solutions that make it really easy to drop it into your app and, and go with it. Um, OpenID Connect is a little bit more on the server level. Um, it kind of goes along with um, OAuth uh, and that whole flow to kind of provide a little bit more information, a little more context around the actual user information. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked with OAuth in the past, but it's really bit more about, um, you know, it's more on the authorization side. Um, you know, you're passing tokens back and forth, but the OAuth spec specifically is just about providing that identification. 
It's not about authorizing the person and getting that token. Uh, OpenID Connect, kind of one of the goals of it was to provide that, that authorization layer on top of it. Um, it had kind of big dreams. Unfortunately, its use is kind of fading. Um, so they're kind of trying to figure out you know, what's going to replace it. Um, but I don't think there's anything that's really popped up yet as a more of a standard. Um, the biometric stuff, like I mentioned, you know, you do fingerprint scans, um, you know, voice recognition, all that, you know, is kind of a really high kind of thing or a really high level of protection, obviously, for a web application. Um, but when you're thinking about, you know, really protecting your data, uh, specifically if people can only access it from a certain place, uh, that makes the biometric stuff a whole lot easier. Um, incidentally, that's also another level that you can have is that it can only be accessed from this certain terminal or this certain IP address or you know, anything like that, this, this range of IP addresses. Um, and while it's not really a type by itself, um, security questions can be used in conjunction with some of the other uh, authentication types to help verify who the user is, um, you know, any information, um, you know, any other information you can get about them. Um, one of the problems with security questions, though, is a lot of them are really, really generic. So it's stuff like, what's your pet's name? Uh, what's your mother's maiden name? You know, all that kind of stuff that basically anybody that goes and looks on your Facebook site or follows you on Twitter or anything like that can probably figure out within, you know, a couple of hours. Um, you know, you'll see some of them that actually let you make up your own security questions, which is, you know, it's a, it's a really good idea. Uh, it makes for a little bit more maintenance on the, you know, on the services side to have to worry about those questions. And I'll show you in a second, uh, because of the Adobe breach, why it's not always a good idea to let people specify the security uh, answers, questions and answers kind of stuff. Um, authorization, the other half of it. Authorization is, um, you know, when a, when a user tries to access a resource, it's verifying that they actually have that correct access. Um, you know, obviously, there's, there's certain things that you have to consider when you're thinking about different levels of access. Uh, there's a concept called the principle of least privilege. And basically what this is, it kind of goes along with the concept of failing securely. Um, the principle of least privilege basically says if you can't verify the user, if you can't verify that they're supposed to be able to access this resource, don't give them anything. Drop them all the way down to, the, you know, to guest access or to the most low level access that you possibly can so that you're protecting your application in every way possible. Um, you know, give them the least amount of privilege. Um, when you're thinking about authorization, you need to think about how coarse or fine-grained that you're getting. Um, you know, a lot of times if you just have roles or just simple permissions, you know, that's kind of a high-level kind of thing. Um, but when you start permissioning based on the data that's inside of the resources or anything, you know, anything contextual about the data, uh, it starts getting a little bit more complex. Um, you know, say you're requesting user information from a REST API and you want to see what groups they're in. Well, what if you have access control on those groups so that you can only see the groups in that list that you have access to? So you can kind of see how you know, filtering down data starts getting a little bit complicated as you get more fine-grained on your, on your controls. Um, and when you're thinking about them, think about uh, the rules around the data access, around the resource access, instead of the roles of the people that are going to be accessing it. Um, especially with something like role-based access control, despite the name, uh, it's really easy to say, you know, okay, this group is everybody in HR. Um, you know, and then you, you get into, okay, this is everybody in HR except these people, so how do you represent that in rules or in roles? Um, so instead, when you're thinking about this stuff, think about it in terms of this person has access to this and this, but not this. And so set up your permissioning a little bit more that way instead of, this group of people, you know, kind of had that access. Um, just some of the quick types of uh, access control. Um, obviously, there's the most basic one, just an access control list. It's a yes or no whenever you ask, uh, ask your system if they have access. Um, there's role-based access controls. Uh, these are getting more complicated as I go. So um, role-based access control, I'm sure most people know what that is, where it's essentially groupings of, you know, permissions that you assign to different groups. Um, and then you get to attribute-based. Um, this is a little, like, if you don't see it, it's a little hard to understand. Uh, 
So on regular access control list and role-based access control, you're saying this person is, you know, has this permission. And this permission relates to this functionality or this data, you know, anything like that. Um, with an attribute-based control system, what you usually have, and there's, there's a standard out there called XAML, it's XACML, um, really complicated, fun XML stuff. Um, if you, you know, want some good reading to put you to sleep, I would suggest reading the spec for XAML. Um, basically what it says is that you have a user and it has certain attributes about it. You know, it has, um, essentially you could think of it as just general, you know, attributes. It has this email address, it has this username. You know, that's, that's kind of attributes for a user. Um, and then you have your resources, which are the endpoint for the resource, the data that's in the resource, you know, the data type, that kind of stuff. Um, what the attribute-based access control does is it takes that information and tries to match that stuff up with a policy. So if your policy says anyone with this kind of username or this, you know, this information in their username has, can access this certain resource, that's, that's what the policy defines, and it tries to match up those attributes. Like I said, it's a little, it's a little harder to explain than it is to see, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the basic, the basic idea behind it. Um, there's just general policy enforcement. Um, you know, it kind of goes along with some of the attribute-based stuff um, where you're just saying you know, they, have to be, they have to adhere to this kind of policy to, you know, to have access. Uh, discretionary controls kind of relates a little bit more towards, um, what's it called? <laughs> I'm trying to remember the term. Um, basically where you give someone else the right to do something. Um, you, know, you, you provide them with the temporary permission or permanent permission to be able to do something like if, you know, if a guy or if a, let's see, what's a good example? If an administrator is out of town, well, maybe a junior administrator, you know, he grants him the rights while he's gone to be able to do something, you know, to be able to sort of administrate the system in a certain way while he's gone, but then it's revoked whenever he comes back. Um, that's not necessarily having to add, you know, add the role and all that. There's a little bit more complicated settings around that stuff. Yeah, proxy, yeah, that's a good word for it. Um, and then there's mandatory controls. Um, just like the name sounds, uh, mandatory controls basically is the most strictest one. Uh, it's saying that you absolutely have to match every single criteria. That's, you know, stuff like your username, you know, it has to be specifically this. You have to be accessing it from this place. You have to be, you know, at this time, that, that kind of stuff. It's, it's very, very strict about access. Um, you know, and, and mandatory controls can kind of be any of the ones above there um, can be used as a mandatory control. The, the key is just that you're requiring those certain things. Um, okay, so I'm gonna kind of start getting into some of the myths that I mentioned. Obviously, multi-factor is uh, a big topic right now. You know, two-factor, three-factor, whatever, um, authentication. Um, you don't see very many places that, that offer any kind of three-factor. Um, there's only maybe two or three that I can think of offhand. Um, but more, more and more services are offering two-factor authentication, whether it's through a hardware token or, you know, an app that lives on your phone. Uh, there's like the Google Authenticator stuff. Um, there's a company called Duo Security uh, that, does a, uh, that makes a pretty nice application. Um, there's Authy. There's, there's a couple of different ones uh, out there that offer solutions that you can kind of put into your application and, and go with. Um, obviously, it's not a cure-all. Uh, it's not going to magically make your system perfectly secure. Um, there's all sorts of other things that could possibly go wrong, but it does provide that little extra, little bit of extra protection um, for you and your users. Um, unfortunately, it can be another hoop that they have to jump through. Um, you know, every time they log into your application, you know, if, if maybe you don't recognize the machine they're logging in from. So you say, okay, put in your token. Well. If you send it out over an SMS, you know, what happens if they're not someplace where they have cell coverage? You know, all of a sudden they can't get their SMS token, so they can't log in. You know, there's, there's still problems with it. Um, you know, there's, there's still, some of the software tokens actually use the one-time password, uh, time-based formula stuff, so that you don't have to necessarily have the SMS connection. Uh, Google Authenticator does that. It's, it's just a rotating one-time password. 
Um, but you know, it, it just depends on the service. It depends on how you want to provide that service to your user. Uh, I mentioned some of the different, different implementations, hardware, software, various things like that. Um, I've even seen some services that will call you uh, and ask you to say something. And so it, and then it verifies that, you know, it's like a keyword or something like that, and it, it detects it and then says, oh, okay, um, you know, go ahead and let them log in. Um, there's one called uh, Clef that it actually shows like a rotating or a uh, shifting barcode kind of thing that you just hold your phone up to and it verifies it that way. Um, it's actually pretty cool whenever you go to a site that has it enabled. Um, if you, you know, you bring up the little login thing and then you hold your phone up to it, the identity is tied to the phone itself, um, you know, whatever account that you set up initially, so that it knows whenever it verifies that, it sends a message back to the cleft servers, which then sends it back to the application that's calling it, so it automatically logs you in. So potentially, you wouldn't need a username and password with that solution. It's not recommended, but you could use it as authentication, you know, a primary authentication, depending on, you know, how you wanted to do it. Um, and then there's the hardware versus software. You know, you have the applications on the phone versus the little RSA tokens. Um, you have to be careful with the tokens, though, because more often than not, they're really expensive to replace, um, and you have to, you know, custom order them from RSA or whatever vendor it is. Um, but you also have to be careful just not to misplace it or put it someplace where it's out in the open. Um, I remember seeing a story years ago about a guy that didn't want to lose his token um, and so he actually set up a webcam that pointed at his token, so from anywhere in the world he could see what the number was on his token. Unfortunately, he didn't secure that webcam, and so it was just completely open, and yeah, and somebody found it, and it was all sorts of fun. So, yeah, hardware tokens are great. Um, there's some other ones, and I, I've got one of these too. Um, there's one called a, a YubiKey um, that you, you basically put it into a USB slot, and you push the little button on it, and it generates a one-time hash. Uh, the key is coded to your account, so the first, the first bit of the string is your account hash, more or less. Um, and then the second bit of the string is just some randomly generated based on an algorithm inside the key. Um, there's a couple of sites out there, more and more sites that are starting to, <coughs> starting to use that. Um, I think Google for Gmail was actually considering introducing that as well. So two factors go to being a backup method, but not necessarily a replacement for your authorization. Um, and it does kind of help increase confidence with your users. Uh, you know, they see that you've introduced this a lot of times, um, well, most of the time, honestly, it's an optional kind of thing. Um, you know, people will enable it if they want to. Uh, I don't know if I've used any services that have strictly enforced the use of two-factor authentication. Um, you know, just because of the whole, you know, like the SMS thing that I mentioned or just various things like that that could possibly go wrong with it. Um, some of them will do something like providing backup codes so that you have a set of five codes that, you know, it, whenever you set up the two-factor authentication, it gives you that set of codes so that if you do happen to be out of the country or something and you can't get an SMS message, you can use one of those codes. But usually when you use one of those codes, all the rest of them are invalid too. Um, so you'll have to regenerate it once you get into the application, write down those codes or print them out or you know, just various things like that. And obviously that depends entirely on their implementation. Um, and sometimes it can help with compliance. There's some regulations that actually require you to provide more than one factor of authentication on your service. Um, usually this is like, I think HIPAA might require something depending on the data that's actually inside of the application. Um, there's a couple of other regulations. I've forgotten the, you know, the acronyms for them, but um, they mention you know, having multiple factors on there. Um, it's not good at being the only method for authentication, and it really doesn't prevent anything um, you know, related to out-of-band attacks. Um, obviously, if you have usernames and passwords on your system, this two-factor authentication is going to do absolutely nothing if somebody breaks in and grabs that uh, username and password information. Um, you know, it will prevent them from getting into your system with that information, but as most people probably do, um, people tend to share passwords between services. So if somebody takes your username and password from one service, 
they go look around, you know, just Google your name, basically, and they go find another service that you're on and try that same username and password, a lot of times it's going to work. And then, you know, magically they have access to all your stuff. Um, so yeah, if anybody's reusing passwords, please go change them immediately. It's a really bad idea. <laughs> I'll show you some of the Adobe stuff here in a second. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's not good at stopping any other attacks, um, like SQL injection. Uh, how many know what SQL injection is? Good, I don't have to explain it. So if you have any kind of SQL injection on your, actually, on your, on your login form or anything like that, it doesn't do anything to prevent uh, any problems there. Um, it also doesn't prevent any kind of identity provider issues. Um, you know, if you're using any kind of federated identity where it's a third-party vendor that, that's maintaining the username and password or authentication information, obviously it's not going to do anything to prevent if they get breached or, you know, there's an issue on their side. Um, that's completely out of the realm of, of any kind of two-factor. So let's talk about passwords. Passwords are ancient. Um, ever since kind of the first days of computing, you know, that somebody put in the concept of, you know, okay, let's have a secret passphrase that the users have to know about uh, to be able to get access to their information. Um, unfortunately, it, it's pretty ancient by today's standards. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of other ways to identify people uh, besides just a, you know, a single passphrase or a sentence or whatever it is. Um, and unfortunately, most people just kind of default to using a password whenever they create a new application. Um, partially because it's the most familiar thing for users. They say, oh, okay, I, you know, I'm used to creating usernames and passwords. Um, there's even whole browser extensions and services around creating hard-to-crack passwords. Um, you know, specifically for these kind of applications. So you can generate those and you don't have to remember them and you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, and there's password policies. Um, so I had a discussion about password policies with someone the other day. Um, they basically were saying that password policies should be done away with. Um, that if you're storing your passwords correctly, it doesn't actually matter what the person is putting in if you're correctly salting and hashing the passwords and storing them that way, then it doesn't really matter. Um, I agree on the storage part, but I disagree on the actual password part. So when you're using a service, you have absolutely no idea how they're storing those passwords on the back end. Um, you just basically have to trust them that they're going to they're going to store them the correct way. They're going to you know maybe even encrypt them depending on the level of protection that they want to have. Um, but if you don't have any kind of password policies, people could just use one 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 as their password, which any kind of password cracker out there or any scanner that any potential attacker would be using could guess in a split second, you know, hundredths of a second. I mean that's super simple. Um, they don't even have to have the database of information of usernames and passwords. They just start guessing it. Um, brute forcing is one of the slowest ways, but if your password has a super low entropy like that, then it's going to be, yeah, I mean, that's, that's bad for your service. Um, so my recommendation was that password policies are good for the actual service to help protect themselves. Um, you know, saying that it has to have a number, it has to have a letter, you know, it has to have special characters. That kind of stuff is a little bit more about helping users kind of come up with good, hard to guess passwords. Um, because if it's easy to guess, you know, obviously the, the would be attacker could get in pretty easily. Um, so I mentioned that they are usually shared across services. Users are bad about coming up with passwords. So when they think they have a clever one, they reuse it. And yes, I'm guilty, unfortunately. Try to change those every once in a while, but it doesn't always work. Um, there are some policies out there that are really restrictive. You know, they say they can only have this kind of information. Um, you know, like I said, if you're, if you're storing them correctly, that kind of stuff doesn't really matter. Um, but more often than not, what you really want to do is say it has to have at least this kind of stuff. You know, it could be... 500 characters long if you wanted it to be, but when the hash is generated, it's always going to be generated down to a, you know, the same size. Like if you bcrypt the hash or bcrypt the password, um, it's always going to be the same size, you know, it doesn't, regardless of the cost factor. 
Um, and it really requires too much work on getting it right in your application. If you're not storing passwords correctly, and you, know, you just have a username and password protecting your application, then that's, you know, that's a single point of failure. If you're, <laughs> if you're storing them in plain text, like yes, some major services do, unfortunately, um, you know, that's, that's basically just asking for it. Um, there is usually a pretty good way to be able to tell if a, um, if a service is, they're either really protecting your, your uh, password by encrypting it, or they're storing it in plain text if you ask for a password reset email and they send you your old password. Um, email is also a very insecure method for this kind of stuff. Um, you know, anybody could potentially get in and read your emails and then they have the password. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, really what you want to see is that they send you a password reset email with a one-time hash on the end of the URL. You go there, you know, you try to change your password, but if you go back in five minutes, it doesn't work anymore. Um, you know, that's, that's a little bit better. And of course, users are no good at coming up with them. Um, you know, replacing letters with numbers or putting an exclamation point on the end, that kind of stuff. You know, most users are like, oh, that's clever. You know, I, that's, that's totally unbreakable. Well, there's lots of password, hash or password crackers out there that specifically do that kind of behavior. They'll run through, you know, all the usernames or all the passwords that they know about uh, in a dictionary and then just start replacing numbers, uh, letters with numbers. And then, of course, cracking hardware is pretty cheap. Um, does anybody know what this is? Well, that too. <laughs> that too. It is. It's a, yeah, it's a set of GPUs. Um, these, are, these are really good at running through hashes. Um, this is actually a pretty, mm, it's a pretty decent system. Um, there's some of them out there that are basically rack-mounted GPUs, um, and they can just run through hashes like you wouldn't believe. Um, the lower, kind of the lower level hashes, like MD5 or SHA-1 or even SHA-256, um, it can run through those things so fast. Uh, you know, I, I know you've probably heard of the rainbow tables and, and all that. And Eli mentioned them in his last, um, last session. But usually for MD5 hashes, this kind of stuff is actually a lot faster than running it through a rainbow table. Um, because rainbow tables have to be stored in database, and so you're limited to whatever, whatever resources the database has to do selects and, and all that. This just basically runs through and generates, you know, either runs through dictionary, it'll grab stuff off of Wikipedia, it'll, you know, it'll, they can do all sorts of stuff to create these word lists. Um, and it just runs through them just lightning fast. Um, that's kind of one of the whole points behind using stuff like Decrypt, where it actually you know, rehashes multiple times, because really all it's doing is slowing down the hash generation. Um, and if you have good policies around password reset, and you know, they have to do it after 30 days, if you have like a Decrypt hash with a cost of you know, maybe 12 or you know, 15, you, you don't want it to be too slow. Um, you know, chances are they're not going to be able to break that hash before the password reset timeout, you know, comes up. Um, so if it rotates fast enough, you're protecting your users another way. Um, as for when it comes to password cracking, there's a couple of different ways. Um, there's an offline attack where basically they use something like a SQL injection to grab all your information. Um, they're not necessarily looking for plain text passwords or anything like that. If they get them, they're really happy. Um, but they can take the username and password information, dump it down to some other location, and then just run their, you know, run their systems against it. Um, you know, they can find all sorts of, all sorts of passwords that way. Um, there's dictionary attacks and just kind of guessing. Um, you know, this is kind of brute force. Um, you know, obviously brute forcing is a little bit more, more on the guessing side. Uh, you know, dictionary attacks, a lot of times whenever you go to a service and you use a dictionary word in your password, it'll warn you now. It'll say, hey, this is based on a dictionary word that we can recognize. You probably shouldn't use that because that's easy to guess. Um, you know, you'll see a lot more of the sites out there and services that give you the little password strength, um, you know, monitor or, um, you know, the little thing on the side. Um, and you can kind of manipulate your password a little bit more that way. Uh, and try to bump that up a little more. Uh, key casting is kind of an interesting concept. It kind of goes along with password policies. Uh, 
if in your password policy you specifically say, OK, it can only contain this information. It can only have numbers, letters, these specific special characters, all that. Well, basically, you're telling an attacker, OK, whenever you grab these hashes and you start running your scans against it, these are the only characters you have to worry about. So you're providing them with extra information if you say you can only use these certain things. Uh, if you say it has to contain at least, then it could be other stuff. You know, they could have spaces, it could have, you know, I don't know, it, I don't know how UTF-8 characters would mess it up. I, I, it depends on how they're storing the passwords. Um, but it could be just about anything if it's, you know, has to contain at least. Um, there's also cloud services out there. Uh, I was surprised to find this out. Um, there are services that you can go and give it hashes, you know, a set of hashes or a single hash, and they'll actually go crack it for you. Um, you know, obviously, you, you pay for the service. Um, but they just you know, send it off to their, their host of servers, and it just runs through it, and you don't even have to worry about having you know, one of those systems or having, you know, having this stuff running on your machines. Um, you know, I, it's kind of debatable about how ethical that is. Um, you know, obviously, I think there's you know, pages of disclaimers you have to read and have to fill out before you can actually use it. But it's interesting that they're out there. Um, and then just general password policies about you know, making things harder to crack, and, you know, increasing the entropy of passwords. Um, so how many people remember the massive Adobe breach that happened a while back? Good. Um, so when they got the password data, they had all these hashes. And you know, potentially, they take these things and they run them through, you know, have the, the, you know, their GPU systems or whatever process through all these hashes, trying all the different combinations, trying to find any collisions, all that kind of stuff. Um, or they could have just looked at the password hints that were also stored with the same data. Now, if you'll notice, this password hint up here at the top, that was their little pa literal password hint, numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which means this hash, you can see these first three are the same, this hash is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, encoded however Adobe was encoding their stuff. So if you're storing your password hints or your security questions or that kind of stuff and you're letting users make up that stuff, be very careful that the information that's in here has nothing to do with the actual password. Um, because they didn't even need to crack the hashes. They already knew what the user's password was because the, pa the user told them in their password hint. So yeah, just, just be very careful about the information that you store. Um, just some general stuff around password policies. Um, you know, just some, some characters to include. Um, if you reduce the number of repeated characters, that increases the entropy of the password. It makes it harder for it to guess. Um, usually, length is going to trump complexity. Um, so, you know, having one that's 256 characters is a whole lot harder for a you know password cracking program to guess because it starts at the lowest. You know, it starts with one, one two, one two three, one two three four. You know, and it starts running through that stuff. So, the longer the string, the longer it's going to take to crack. Um, if you use a slow algorithm like Bcrypt, um, how many people know have used Bcrypt in their applications? Good, good. Um, so Bcrypt, for those that aren't using it, essentially you give it the information and it comes with a, you, you specify a cost factor. And that cost is how many times it rehashes that information and then it spits back out that hash, that end result hash. Um, so basically the point of it, or one of the points of it, um, is to slow down the hashing process. Um, you don't want to put the Bcrypt cost factor too high because then it starts slowing things down for your application. But the higher it is, the longer it takes to figure out what the original string that that hash came from was. Um, oops. There we go. And salting and hashing, at the very least, um, you know, obviously you can do some kind of encryption. But the benefit behind um, you know, hashing your passwords is that it's a one-way hash. You never actually know what the user's password is. You just kind of have to trust them that they're coming up with a good password and that their account's not going to get compromised because of it. Um, if you're a reader of XKCD, you, I'm sure you've seen this one before. You know, obviously, this is not, uh, you know, it has no special characters. It has no, you know, uh, it only has letters in it, lowercase letters. But it still has quite a bit of entropy to it because it's, you know, 
it's got randomized kind of little bit of randomized letters it's got spaces in it it's longer you know it's it, it has various things going for it and this guy has done the math around it so I'm not even gonna try to get into it There's math and encryption and all that kind of stuff is a whole different story it's and it's crazy um, so the third myth um, internal versus cloud authentication um, traditionally you've had you know the internal systems the user comes and accesses your system you do authentication internally and you handle all that stuff on your servers you know maybe they're authenticating against LDAP or you know just your own stored usernames and passwords all that um, but with the with the introduction of cloud-based authentication um, you know you have that extra step so the user comes to your application you essentially pass that request out to the cloud application it verifies the user information you know returns back the yes or no and then you spit that back out to the user um, obviously there's some extra security implement uh, security issues uh, that come along with using a cloud service for this kind of stuff um, but a lot of them go to great lengths to kind of protect your information and protect your user stuff um, some benefits of internal access control um, obviously you have more control over it um, you know it has a few more traditional options um, you know you can integrate it with your own authentication systems if you have you know the the system that your your own employees use um, you know you can have something that implements that if it's calling out to an internal API or whatever um, you have the complete control over doing that um, and it's a little bit easier to customize because you can have you know it hit a certain server that's then firewalled to only access this kind of service you know you, you can kind of customize it a little bit more and you don't have to worry about stuff tra traveling out over public networks um, unfortunately it comes with some downsides there's the extra hardware and cost that comes with it um, and there's just there's tons of different authentication and authorization tools out there um, if you don't already have one then trying to figure out one that meets your needs can be pretty complicated uh, it just depends and a lot of times if it's internal then some companies and some services you know they have internal servers um, are a little bit less strict on how they use encryption and protecting the data they think oh it's an internal server it's protected by firewalls nothing could ever happen to it um, and then they kind of forget that if somebody gets a malicious email inside the corporate network and somebody happens to be able to figure out what their internal IPs are you know if they're using the um, you know 192.168 IPs or the 10.0.0 IPs um, you know a potentially malicious email with some JavaScript in it or something like that could just go out in there and start scanning stuff take that information and send it back out to a server um, they don't think about the internal threats that could potentially happen as a part of you know as a part of an attack they tend to think about things coming into their network from the outside um, when you're thinking about the cloud-based stuff um, you know a lot of times they'll have some benefits um, they'll have you know kind of standardized authentication methods you know they'll use SAML they'll use an API that has kind of a standard format um, they're usually a little bit more flexible uh, you know if you have a need for more than one authentication server you know you're not just limited to whatever you happen to have in the data center uh, you know you can say okay I'm getting under, under really heavy load right now can you fire up three more authentication servers for me so I can pass them off and round robin between them that makes it a little bit easier um, and you have the cost savings of not actually having to buy all that hardware yourself if you don't necessarily need it it's a little bit more on demand and like I mentioned usually they'll provide a whole lot le higher level of encryption and protection than you may necessarily provide internally um, unfortunately you do have a little bit less control over it um, you know you're you're not getting the level of customization that you can have with an internal server you know configuring it specifically for your environment um, and there's a limited number of providers out there right now um, it's kind of growing all the time but it's still since there's still all the debate about you know whether it's secure enough or not there's not a whole lot of people jumping into that space just yet um, some of the standardized methods I mentioned for connecting there's SAML uh, which is a special markup language that was created specifically for security kind of stuff um, it has all sorts of fun things in its spec another good thing to put you to sleep at night um, I think the SAML spec is actually quite a bit longer than the XAML spec so if you're having really trouble getting to sleep you could try that one 
Um, there's a thing called a vaulted post request, which essentially means that the user authenticates to you with a post request, and then you take that and you make the post request out to the other system. So you're just kind of passing it along, and then the information comes directly back. Um, it's not quite the same thing as making an API request, but it's a little bit more, it's a little bit easier to implement. You know, there's not as much overhead as, as parsing API responses. Uh, you can integrate multi-factor into these. Uh, there's a couple of services that actually let you use other services that provide multi-factor authentication. So everything just kind of fits together and plugs in together. And then there's the concept of federated identity. Um, so for those that aren't familiar with it, federated identity is the, um, the identity provider is the one that stores the information. It stores all the user, you know, user details, essentially. It depends on how much they want to store. Uh, it could just be username and password, could be the full user data, it just depends. Um, but they store it, and when you authenticate, you authenticate off of them. Um, it's kind of kind of like the uh, OAuth flow. Like if you ever go to, you know, if you go to an ex or go to an external site and it says, I want to use your Twitter account, you get shifted back over to Twitter and you say, okay, I authorize this application, and then it passes it back over that way. You know, there's different kinds of identity uh, flows like that. Um, or they could use a custom API. Um, when you're looking for like a cloud-based service, um, you want to look for something that's easy to integrate, uh, that can scale really easily. And something that has a, um, an integration for provisioning, so that if you create a new user like internal to your company, then they have something on their system that you can just call out to and say, hey, I created this new user, here's their information, and they automatically create it on their side. So you don't necessarily have to store that information in two places, you can just pass it along to that service and it, you know, and it goes along. Um, looking for standardized user authentication methods, and you definitely want to look for something that has good uh, management and monitoring tools. Um, preferably something that has good alerting that's more than just email. Um, you know, if it has you know, text messaging or, or anything else like that, you know, even callbacks um, to where it can help you know, protect your systems a little bit more from any kind of you know, attack that might be coming in. Um, so the fourth myth is a little bit more about authentication, authentication issues, um, you know, a little bit more specifically. Um, hopefully you're familiar with the OWASP Top 10. Uh, they recently released a new version of it. So if you haven't looked at it in a while, it's slightly changed, not by a whole lot, um, but just a little bit. They've included something for third-party libraries um, and combined a few of the other ones. Um, but there's three of them that kind of relate specifically to authentication and authorization. Um, the first one, the, it's the second on the list, and they order these by, by prevalence and by you know, how easy they are to exploit, all that kind of stuff. Um, the first one, broken authentication and session management, is basically anything, you know, anything from any kind of injection problems or bad user data handling, just anything like that that could potentially um, you know, open a hole in your system, cause any kind of exploits, that kind of stuff. Um, the insecure object references is basically when someone tries to access something that they shouldn't, um, like with a, you know, maybe with a REST API, if you're, and I got into a conversation on Twitter about this earlier uh, yesterday, um, if you're using IDs on your REST API, it's, you know, there's the potential for somebody to be able to guess the next ID that's something that doesn't belong to them. Well, if you're not adequately checking that that user has access to that stuff, if you're just saying, okay, they're logged in, they should have access, then they're accessing somebody else's data just by guessing, you know, guessing a URL um, and hitting it directly. Um, you know, if you use something like a GUID or some kind of, um, you know, slug or transform it somehow, that's a little bit better. You know, they can't just guess it and, you know, guess it directly. Um, and then sensitive data exposure, exposing any kind of information, whether it's through exceptions or errors, um, you know, exposing it that way, um, or exposing user information that doesn't need to be exposed. Um, you know, like certain parts of the application showing more information than needs to be shown. Um, there's just some general bad practices, obviously sending plain text passwords. Um, if you ever get a plain text password from any service, um, even if it's resetting a password and it sends you the plain text password, that's not a good thing. 
like I said, they probably should be sending a URL where you can go set the password. Um, you know, if it sends you a plain text password, you have no idea of knowing if that has any kind of expiration attached to it. Um, you know, if somebody sends you a plain text password a week ago, you know, and you go in and it's not, it doesn't have any kind of expiration attached to it, you know, if that still works, then somebody could just potentially start going through without your knowledge. And if it's a, you know, a randomized six letter, you know, password, it's not going to take that long for them to figure out what that password is if you haven't reset it yourself. Um, you know, and you, again, you have no way of knowing if they're rotating that stuff or if they have any kind of expiration date on it. Um, you want to be sure that there's no sensitive data in the URL. There's no account numbers. There's no uh, user information, anything like that, uh, because all that information is logged in the Apache logs on the request, the get string. So if your actual server was ever compromised, then they would have that, all that information and potentially give them you know, any kind of access, any kind of other data that th they might need for other services as well. Um, I apologize, my throat is really dry, so I keep drinking. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have informative error messages, um, you know, if you just say there was an error, or if you go to the other extreme and you say, OK, there was an error, and here's the full stack trace on it. That's, that's bad, obviously. You know, you, somebody tries to hit your API, and you say, OK, there's an error on here, and here's everything. They're going to they're gonna see that, and they're going to say, oh, well, I can intentionally cause errors on all these different resources, and I can start to map out the application, because they're giving me the, you know, the, UR, or the um, file paths for all this, what kind of exception it was, just, just various stuff. Um, so you always want to be sure that you're providing just enough information. Um, to your users to, to where they can determine what the, uh, what the issue is. Um, and then another problem is that a lot of services don't have any kind of throttling on um, password resets or registrations. Um, you know, automated scripts can just go out there and just try, you know, start doing password resets, and they're not monitoring IPs or anything like that, and so it just keeps going and going and going and going. Um, you know, you can do some of the stuff like Eli mentioned about introducing CAPTCHAs. Um, you know, you'll see some services that if you fail to authenticate, you know, three times in a row, well, the next time it pops up a CAPTCHA. And it says, okay, this could be an attack, so we want to be sure and prevent that kind of stuff. So let's add that extra layer of security in there of having something that it's really difficult for a machine to guess. Um, and they also don't have any throttling on password failures. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, you know, they try to log in, log in, brute forcing, um, which is one of the slowest methods, but there are still scripts and stuff out there that do that. Um, don't assume that just because you don't reference it anywhere that people won't guess what it is, uh, what the, like the URL is. Um, there are some, soft, some pieces of software out there, scanning tools, that have a set of common URLs for um, different pieces of hardware or different pieces of software that say, like, you know, for like WordPress, wp-admin, is always the administration page. Well, if it can get to that, then it can try to start, you know, brute forcing usernames and passwords because you haven't protected that resource. Um, you know, so you always want to be sure that if you have any kind of administrative functionality um, or pages or anything on your service, that you always want to protect them. You don't want to just assume that since it's not referenced, that nobody will ever find it. Uh -huh. Oh, jeez. Uh, okay, hang on. Uh, let's see. I apologize. Am I on, am I on time? I mean, like, am I done? Oh, no. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I do want to go through some of this stuff just real quick. Um, some of the things that we can do to help fix your authentication authorization. I apologize, I rambled on on some of this stuff. Um, the, de the concept of defense in depth is essentially not having one thing, you know, having multiple layers of authentication. Um, you definitely want to be sure you have good logging and auditing because if you're not using that information, um, you're just basically leaving your service open to a potential attack because you have no idea what's going on. Um, failing securely is kind of the whole least privilege thing as well. Uh, yeah, least privilege. Um, and to kind of get a good idea of where you're at and, you know, and figure out a good solution, um, you want to go through, go through your current components, um, kind of gather some of the usage of them, 
uh, you know, the different parts of your application, uh, how they're being used. Um, plan some of that stuff, and obviously it's easier to have an application and go back and figure out this stuff, figure out the usage patterns and everything, uh, rather than trying to anticipate that kind of stuff before you create an application. Um, when you're thinking ahead, think about the subject uh, and not necessarily the user. Um, you know, who, who's using it, not necessarily the data about that user. Sorry, I'm kind of glossing over a lot of this stuff. Um, and you want to definitely narrow down the options, you know, pick the, the right service and the right tools and the right technology that's, that's good for you and your, ser your service. Um, and pick the right fit, not necessarily the, the, you know, the new hotness that's out there. Uh, don't implement two-factor just because. Um, you know, it's a good thing to have, but if you don't necessarily need it for your internal application that only 10 people in the company use, there's not really any sense in putting it in for that kind of stuff. Um, and then also, uh, be sure and plan when you're thinking about your authentication. One thing that's easy to forget about is delegation. Um, kind of some of those sharing controls, the, the proxy stuff uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, sorry, if, if anybody's interested, I'm more than happy to talk about the rest of this stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, so identity, uh, hopefully I've kind of given you an idea, uh, you know, that identity, authentication, authorization, verifying all this stuff is really difficult. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff that you have to consider about it. Um, there's a whole a whole branch of security of the security world that just deals with identity um, and it's very there's lots of different technologies lots of different standards all that kind of stuff um, that they have to worry about so unfortunately I'm out of time but I will be around here if you have questions comments um, please rate me on joined in and please tell me to talk less next time so that I remember I went way over um, and if you're interested, this uh, WebSec.io site uh, is a site I've written up. Uh, a lot of them are PHP-specific tutorials, uh, security tutorials, but some of them are just general concepts. Um, but I'd appreciate it if you, you know, check it out, tell me what you think. That, that would be great. So, anyway, thank you. <laughs>